Thank you. Whoops. Hello? Okay. On the air? Uh, okay, pointer seems working. Is, that, is everything set? Status beya? See? Okay. Perfecto. Ready to start. Uh, buen día. Buenos días. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's extremely pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the organizers. Uh, amazing talks. Um, I'm from Barcelona, so I'm extremely happy to be here presenting our work. Uh, with me, it's Salim. Uh, Hello. Salim's been at Google for more than 15 years. To me, he's one of the superstars. Uh, he's been working at SRE. He teaches a bunch of distributed system classes. And the funny fact that I was just remember when I was sitting <laughs> over there is he was my mentor. But he was my mentor only for one day. <laughs> he, had, he, had to, he had to quit. <laughs> uh, as I said, I was born and raised in Barcelona. Uh, I studied at La Salle, then got my PhD in UPC. And I've been already seen some familiar faces because some of my students are around. And like, some of them are like superstars, CEOs, leaders at amazing companies. Okay. So let's get started. Today we're going to talk about productionizing machine learning. Uh, we're going to talk about how teams at Google put machine learnings into their service, services that work at the scale of the world. Oh, whoops, this is too fast. Am I in the way? OK. So the first of all, disclaimer, we're not machine learning ninjas. Uh, I've developed a couple of machine learning models, but we, I'm not also a data scientist. We're just basically two experienced SREs that two years ago we decided, OK, I want to do a talk about something that we become an expert. We're going to do this on our 20% project. And what we're going to do is the wall is trying to use machine learning. And there's teams at Google that have been doing this for more than 10 years. How do they do it? How are they successful at having this in production and not breaking? What are the experiences that we can grab from those people and then share it with the wall? OK, so what we did is we started interviewing most of these teams and grabbing a lot of those experiences in papers and on talks. Understanding machine learning and its relevance to the services that we as engineers are responsible for operating is important because we find machine learning and services all around us. The phones that many of you have today with you, you can open an application, use the camera, and translate between language pairs. Those translations are no longer merely statistically based. They use machine learning in order to provide real-time and very accurate translations. Similarly, there are suggestions from the uh, Android keyboard using an application such as Gboard that uh, suggest different emoji or GIFs to include as you're typing to further animate and enhance your communication. YouTube has a very famous Watch Next feature that has been the vanguard of machine learning at Google, and for over a decade has been our premier or flagship product that uses in, uh, all these signals to suggest what video you should watch next. In hardware, such as autonomous or self-driving cars, Machine learning is critical to understanding all the different obstacles and parameters of the roadway. In addition to all the hard data that these cars use, they rely on machine learning and continuously improving models in order to make their way on the roads. The Google Assistant is an example of a uh, very personalized machine learning system where you and the uh, product such as Google Home will interact, and it builds a model based on your voice in order to develop a conversation style with you. In Gmail, as you type or re respond to a message, the system will suggest quick replies or the phrases to use in that message. There's a lot of ML on our phones. Then, for example, we took a look at Carlos's phone even before he returned to Barcelona for this trip. Google Maps suggested new restaurants that he might want to try. It showed photos of him and his friend Enrique. And I think perhaps best, hey, he didn't even have to write out an email message to me about this trip because the machine learning model understood that as he began sending a message to me, he, it already predicted correctly and accurately what he was going to write about. 
<laughs> ML is also behind the scenes. That is, it powers a lot of the ways that these applications are successful. The example of photo tagging is one. The, it, uh, the photo tagging is a pipeline that runs, applies tags to faces in the photos that you take, and then suggest moments, memories. And this is a user-facing feature that is because of behind-the-scenes machine learning. In the center, we see email. Now, consider the, your inbox. It's a very precious resource. We use uh, neural networks and machine learning to uh, move all of the spam aside so that only the mail that you want to read, that's correct mail sent to you, appears in your inbox. And there are many other workflows that take data, analyze it, produce a model, and then do th such things as inputs to our electrical grid or our traffic control infrastructure to help make our cities and urban infrastructure move smoothly. Those aren't necessarily things that Google is doing, but these are ways that machine learning is around us. But how does ML start? Let's do one thing. Let's change the sides. See? I think it's going to be better that way. So I've seen this uh, with several friends. I've also seen this at Google. Uh, there's basically an executive idea that somebody says, wow, everybody's gaga about machine learning. You know, can we achieve this with machine learning? Can we implement something like the future? Can we imagine this happening in our service? And then you go back in the stage, you get a backend, you get a data, data scientist that starts building a model. And finally, boom, magic. You've got a self-driving car. So that's something that happens, and it looks like magic. But you know, there's a lot of process that we need to take into account if we want to do this in any uh, information technology system. OK, so let's, let's look at something that most of you are familiar with, a LOX pipeline. I'm thinking about Telefonica, Olaluf. I'm thinking about a bunch of services where you're collecting LOCs, and they could be distributed. You have a bunch of producers. You basically compact or merge all the information. Then you do some processing. And at the end, you've got a front-end server where you basically have consumers receiving their bills. Okay? We're very familiar with this pipeline. So how do we add machine learning here? This is something that we're going to try to tackle during this talk. Where do I do the machine learning building of the model? Where do I put the inference? So we've started our talk with an introduction, trying to motivate ML systems. Now we're going to focus in what we believe are best practices for machine learning systems. Then we're going to move to observability, which is one of Slim's favorite topic. As an SRE or a developer uh, ops, you want to basically see your system from outside. You want to make sure that everything is working, and sometimes you don't need to know what's happening inside. Then we're going to give you five rules to survive, which are based on all of the interviews from many different teams at Google, and what we believe will help you when deploying machine learning. And then we'll finalize with some conclusions and the future. So let's take a closer look at an ML pipeline. Theoretically, it looks like this. There are two distinct phases. On top, we see the training phase, which usually happens in a batch process or offline. And then on the bottom part, we see the serving phase. The training phase takes all this data, transforms it, builds a model. Uh, and this model building is very compute intensive. Remember that, because it will play a big role in our best practices. There's a validation phase, where you make sure that the model that you've built is useful in some way. Take that model, push it to production, and then it's serving. Users can ask questions of the application. The model helps return responses to the user. This is where most of the time and effort is spent, but the compute resources may be very distinct. However, this is deprecated. We have found that it is not reliable. It does not provide sufficient instrumentation or observability, and there are key elements for monitoring that don't even appear here. The best practices we're going to describe will help you build more reliable, deploy faster, and more production-ready systems. You'll also be more able to understand the configuration and behavior of your system. And we'll also touch on practices around privacy, which is an essential first-class component of building and operating any, machine, any system that includes machine learning. OK, 
Okay, uh, we're going to move into the very first best practice, which is data quality. Something that you have to take into account is that model behavior is driven by data. When I was talking about the log processing, the log processing behavior for that company, it's always the same. It doesn't depend on the data. The only thing that changes for that pipeline is if you produce more, electrical, more electricity for a user, he's going to get charged for more money. However, when you're building a model, depending on your data, you're going to be biased. You're going to give different information to the users. The outcome can be very variable. In order to do this, in order to guarantee data quality, we're going to focus in filtering data, imputing data, making sure that your data is complete, and then finally, making sure that your data is correct. What does data filtering mean? So basically, in this example, what it means is, for example, eliminating duplicates, and then it means eliminating spam. Spam or abuse, abuse users is something that you might not be aware, but you always need to take into account. And one of the considerations when thinking about a spam is that the production of your data might go faster than the way you detect the spam. So you might have to have several pipelines or additional pipelines that make sure that that spam is basically uh, normalized or uh, taken out from your training data. We've got rid of duplicates. The second one is basically data imputation. You're all familiar with the null value on the first row. And then you're familiar, for example, that somebody as Maria in row three with H0 doesn't look <laughs> something uh, good. You also have to be aware that people might not want to classify themselves as male or female. Somebody might want to classify themselves as a gender. So that's a valid sex. And when you're designing the schema of your database, sometimes we think about binary. And that nowadays, it doesn't work this way. And the other one is the last one. You know, Buena Fuente, 150 years old, and politician. To me, that looks like a spam. Then we move to complete, completeness. Something that we've observed is that you've got a bunch of old data that you're using to train your model. But new data is being generated. With the new data, you've got new sensors. Then when you've got to merge that data, you have mechanisms in your automation that normalize the values that are missing in your old data so that everything follows the same schema. And also, data ratios. So consider a video service that we might use that gets data from Asia, Europe, gets data from any, many other countries. Okay? What happens on the Super Bowl day? In America, everybody is producing videos about football. Then what happens if we don't take into account that ratio? It would mean that for a month, everybody in Asia or Europe might be looking for football videos. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't like football, American football. I like soccer. Then the rate of people watching next videos on that service, you know, might be going down, revenue is going down, we're not happy. And then finally, to guarantee data quality, correctness. One way of having correct data is trained a lot, and we do that with the snapshots. The amount of videos that YouTube has in order to train the watch neck feature is insane. We need a lot of computational power in order to generate those videos. So what they do is they take a snapshots with information or videos from the last week or from the last month, and then we do additions. That means that when we train a new model, we take a snapshot, and then we always work just computing uh, through the snapshot. Bias. What happens if I train my data with more information from male than female? Basically, I'm going to give outputs that are usually recommendations for male, and that's going to be a biased information that I don't want to have. And finally, the anomalies that I mentioned, which are part of completeness and correctness. One second. And a lot of these anomalies, these erratic instances, these are things that we've encountered both in models that we've built and deployed and in the conversations we've had with groups around Google. Production changes very fast. That means data changes very fast. Every day, we have new photos. We have new appearance, new haircuts, new beer. Okay? The way data scientists will tell you this 
is that model loss, how accurate is your model on predicting outputs, it's basically decreasing, it's basically increasing, which means it's bad. So for example, this was some time ago in the morning in New York when I was riding my bike with my stupid helmet. Then I wanted to get a fancy haircut and I looked that way. And the machine learning model is evolving because they capture the pictures on my phone. I basically tag initially that I'm Carlos and the machine learning pipeline is keeping up. You know, one morning, I'm this strange guy. Then, someday in the future, all the, all the pictures are in the future, then I look younger. So the machine learning is successful because we are training continuously, continuously. So it's able to keep up on how I change. And sometimes, it doesn't keep up <laughs> because I just go to this stupid competition and I take my swimming cup in a weird way. Okay, so now I'm basically going to start by showing how the pipeline should look based on the experience that we have at Google with several of the services. So I'm going to divide this in three different steps. The first one is training. The training phase is now part of production. If you stop training, you won't be able to tag photos. You won't be able to show next videos. You won't be able to auto-complete the search. So training is part of DevOps or site reliability engineer's responsibility. So what we do is we have a bunch of production data, we do imputation, as I described, we filter, and then we aggregate. That's the data quality phase. Then once we have that, what we do is we have use a bunch of compute resources to train different models. Remember, the models are defined by the data. So data quality, first class citizen. That's the very first thing every team told us. Data quality, data quality. Finally, once you finish doing the computation, you need to validate your model. What that means is that you use data from production that you did not use during training. That's new data. And then you make sure that the outputs are on a certain range or values that you are happy with. When you do the validation, you might have your data scientist that has given you three different options. Neural networks, gradient trees, there's a bunch of options inside machine learning. And then what you'll have basically is different checkpoints, different options that you can put later in production. Then we move into the qualification phase. Now we are already in production. We've already have models that seem to be ready for production. Then instead of having production data that was offline, now I've added the label as live data. This data comes directly from you guys, from users, from me. Then we use a trained model and then we start doing predictions, okay? We see if it's working with live data, because maybe, you know, the next day is another year or something has changed. And then we have alerting to detect how this is working. The output that I'm using here in prediction is not an output that is going to you as an end-up user. It's an output that is going to a lock so that I basically can decide, is it good or not? There's an additional model in production that is giving you results as a user. And what we do with qualification is we champion a model. We get a model, we make sure that it works, we make sure that it's as accurate or more than the previous one, and then we need a stamp, we get a signature. And a signature is, not, is just basically a file that adds metadata. It basically says this model was produced at this timestamp, and it's compatible with this TensorFlow or whatever framework API. It adds the version, and it gives us the inputs and the outputs. TensorFlow and many machine learning frameworks change continuously. This is a growing field that is going so fast that it happens many times Then, when you try to use it, you know versions keep going up. So we've seen many teams deploying a model and basically breaking it because the binaries were basically using already a newer or an older version. Finally, inference in production. That's where we have our users. Again, live data, we do data imputation. I'm not doing filtering here because I basically cannot stop users from using my service. I might decide if I want to have an output or not. And then what we do in production is that we have one champion model. But then it comes that day of the week that you want to produce another model. And Ricardo, by the way, this is not going to happen on a Friday. We push a new model, and they basically what we do is we do A-B testing. So we have 100% of our traffic go into one model, and then we have an up, and we start going up, 
and giving a 10% to a new model. And then we have monitoring over metrics for the newest model. And as soon as we see that there's engagement, that the metrics tells us that it's good, we keep going. We keep going. And you can imagine that, that if you use a global service, worldwide service, we might do that with a canary, you know, num several number of users in a region. Okay? And then if you're happy, whoop, you can go 100%. This is also very useful because if it breaks, you immediately see it with like 2%, 1% of your traffic, hopefully. Hopefully you can go 50% when this is breaking. And if it breaks, it means you lack of metrics, you lack of monitoring. Fast rollbacks are key. And that is one outcome of having A-B testing. OK? And finally, the whole picture. Summary. Training at the top, data quality by doing imputation and filtering. Second phase, qualification. I want to have a model that is champion. I want to have a signature. And then finally, live serving, where users are basically using the machine learning. In that slide with the complete picture, there was a black box that said alerting. <clears throat> Let's look into what makes that black box a viable thing by talking about observability. For site reliability engineers, observability starts with having a complete picture of your system. And this may be a diagram that shows request flow, something like this, where you know the path from the client all the way down to the storage layer. You may be logging some of the information, <clears throat> the interactions between different components in your system, the microservices, perhaps. You may also have user-facing monitoring, so you know how much traffic you're getting at what time of the day. You may also have endpoint testing. All of these are important to form a complete picture of what's happening in your system. You can also take this logging data and put it into a time series database and uh, have some visualization through Grafana. As we've seen some examples of that already today. This is all the fundamental for observability. In order to provide end-to-end -end debu uh, debugging of a system, you might go to the next step and within the code, add instrumentation using LightStep or um, Zipkin, some one of the dapper-based tracing protocols. And this will help you further understand your intuition of how the system is working. So the logging shows you the data that your system receives and how it operates. The tracing shows you the timing and latency through various points in the system. And there, Zipkin, for example, provides visualization around this. But still, we don't have enough color in the system. We don't understand all of the interaction that will lead to a user being happy and engaged with the service you're providing. How can we achieve that? How do we know, for example, if we were to ask someone to build us an apartment block, that we get something amazing and magical, like La Pedrera? There's no, uh, no way to predict this, but once you do something like this and a user is full of delight, you want to understand that and build on it. Understanding the outputs from machine learning systems is very difficult, because for every user, the output will be slightly different, perhaps even vastly different. This makes introspection machine learning a very big challenge. We've found that treating these ML systems as a black box is a natural fit. So let's take a look at how we can add some quantifiable metrics through a black box approach. A black box simply means that between the request and the outcome, there's some implementation. We don't care what's inside it. We want to consider the performance and behavior of the system from the user's perspective. If we, a user, issue a request, if we ask something of our Google Assistant, or if we're working with a, uh, watching some YouTube videos, will we have a reasonable outcome? Will we be happy with the outcome? Again, we're making no assumptions about the implementation. We're allowing the system to do what it does, and then we measure from the user's perspective how quickly they got the response and how they interacted with it. Did they accept the response, or did they go somewhere else, to another website, to another video? Something like that. By putting some color into our system with observability, we can better understand the user's perspective. We'll ask ourselves the questions about presence. Is our machine learning model actually serving results? Is it in the request path? Does our system have sufficient resources to serve? 
Recall from earlier that the resources used in the training phase will be vastly different. They're smaller and at times very physically different from the resources that you use in the serving phase. Do you know for certain that your system is delivering these responses quickly? As users make requests, do they have that natural flow of conversation with an automated system so that they don't even realize they're talking to a machine? They're just talking. Is the user happily engaged with the feature? And this can be one of the more ch most challenging metrics and one where we found that in addition to automation, having humans also evaluating the outcomes will provide added benefit. And when you can answer the question, is your user happily engaged with your features, then you know for sure that you've achieved observability. Okay. So the way we're going to try to solve all these questions is with what we call five rules to survive. And Salim and I are both parents. We are both fathers of kids. So we've always thought about this as we don't want to be five nights without sleep. Okay? So I'm going to talk about rule number one. If you're a father, you might disagree with me, but presence is very, very important. No matter where I, will, where I go, I don't know why, I've got a <laughs> pacifier with me, okay? Presence is the first metric that you need. It helps late detection. And now I'm gonna describe what late detection means to you. And for that purpose, I'm gonna use blameless culture. So we talked to a bunch of teams at Google. Some of them told us, well, most of them told us all the outages that they had. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a bunch of Google products and a bunch of the outages that we saw, and then I'm going to invent the, correlate, the relation between them, just because I basically don't want to say maps fail on this, because I'm not allowed to say that, okay? So I'm going to do that through different examples. We've got this printing service company, okay? They produce photo albums in paper, and they, they see that they receive less albums. That means less revenue, okay? They are plugged with a photo service system. And the communication is working, you know? The logs show that, you know, orders are still arriving. Then you go to the photo system and you see, you know, photos is still growing. People are crazy taking selfies and photos. The number of users that are searching for photos has not changed. It's also increasing. So what's going on? At some point, we basically stopped doing face tagging. The model crashed. We didn't have a presence metric. Nobody thought that was important because we were monitoring only revenue. And then we had basically an outage with late detection. It took a while us to detect that the root cause was earlier in the pipeline. Second example, revenue of advertisement is decreasing on your video service. The advertisement visualization is correlating. You know, people are looking at less videos, therefore less ads. The next videos, the ones you get on your right and you click, the rate of clicks is also decreasing. However, when I go to the website, I still see my videos. Peppa Pig or whatever my daughter is clicking on my computer or my tablet, you know? <laughs> they are still personalized, those ones that I hate that my daughter clicks or the ones that I love. So what's going on? So at some point, the personalization machine learning pipeline is stop. It is stop adding new videos. So I basically have my collection, but it's getting older. The same thing as my face was changing, okay? So summary for the presence metric. You want, the problem is that your model is not running and you want to detect, and you don't want detection to occur late. You need to check resources, binary compatibility, configuration, and others. And the presence can be uh, checked with a metric or it can be checked by the model signature. And I'll confess one thing. All the jobs at Google, all the binaries that we run by default for free, they have this metric. And since they have this metric when I compile and I run them, I have monitoring. And for free, I have alerting. And the only thing that I'm missing is a page. The TL or the team is the one deciding if the presence metric is missing, besides having an alerting on a dashboard, should I page the own color? Also, as parents, we want to ensure that our children have the highest quality inputs. Wait, yeah, 
parents' inputs. So the best food for our children. Now, let's talk about the inputs to the data quality of our ML pipelines. On this screen, we have a handful of dashboards from a very popular, very high-traffic Google service. And this is something that product managers and engineers can use. Across the bottom of each of these graphs, each collects a different metric, and across the bottom, we see the days of the week. The y-axes are the rates of ingestion, and we've hidden them for confidentiality reasons. And people can look at this dashboard and see how many of the, input, of the requests did our system successfully recognize, how many did we not successfully recognize. So that gives us an opportunity to uh, tune hyperparameters. In addition, we get a sense of the latency in various segments of the system and the success at which we delivered responses. And we can see a change midweek. This is likely when we deployed a new model. In order to uh, answer the question of uh, uh, the, how do we provide high-quality data and understand both the ingestion and distribution of this data, we ask ourselves the, why, because this is important in order to drive the quality of the model and the predictions that we return to users. And our solution is to train or to test the data. We're testing the data against the features that we deliver. And on the previous slide, we showed the response from the features that it recognized and that failed to recognize. And we examined the precision and recall of the model. Earlier, we mentioned, as we're looking at the photographs of Carlos, that the system is very good at recognizing all of the photos until something very unusual came into the system. Not so unusual that we couldn't recognize it, but unusual enough that our system did not have confidence that that photo of Carlos pulling off his swim cap was also Carlos. So this is where we need to improve the precision of the model. And we iterate, we continuously refine the data. And that addresses the problem of ensuring data quality. We also want to test the models as we deploy them. Carlos showed us the blending for the canary process. And this means that we have the right model functioning in the right context as it goes out to users. We wind up with a child in the stroller, not the puppy. And here, again, we see on the x-axis time. And you can use any metric on the y-axis. The key thing for this graph is that the canary deployment caught an error. Suppose it was latency, suppose it was accuracy, before the version in production did. And this meant that fewer users were exposed to the, uh, bad, uh, the, the poor performing version of this model. And we were able to do something, roll it back, change the model before it hit production entirely. So to address the problem of having a broken deployment in production, where you have a, either something is completely broken, a model that won't or can't serve, or a model that is poorly performing, we want to ensure that no bad models reach production. We have uh, a requirement that all models have a signature, and this ensures that the, there's metadata so that you know that the correct version of the binary is running against the correct version of your uh, machine learning framework. Those two must be in agreement. We've seen many outages uh, because they were not in agreement. You canary, always canary your deployments. This is true of probably every system that we've worked with, it's increasingly important for machine learning systems. And you can also provide for A-B testing, so that as you're rolling out a new model, you can uh, ensure that it meets or exceeds the baseline of your previous model. Rule number four, understand your system's resource usage. And this is a key part of observability that is complex, and we're going to get into how you can do this. These graphs, again, have on the x-axis time. And then we see for the training phase on the right-hand side, or rather on the top, and the serving phase on the bottom, the number of example, uh, requests were, uh, that the system is processing per second, and the throughput for the system during the training phase. On the bottom, we also see the request per second, and the number of requests per second per phase of the pipeline. We're collecting this data because you can't analyze what you don't have. 
And when we have all of this data about the system's performance in the various phases, we can use that to build a capacity plan. Many capacity plans are based on organic growth. That is, we, see, we put a best fit line between a year's worth of historical data, we extend it, and that's our capacity plan. That's good. That is viable. It does not, however, account for a viral case or when your system is just initially launching. Oops. So to understand these, you also need to look at the resources the system consumes in production as it's running. We're looking at traditional resources, and these graphs again show time on the x-axis and then various quantities on the uh, y-axis. Traditional resources such as CPUs, memory, uh, we might also want to consider disk because machine learning requires terabytes and terabytes of data that are ever-growing. We often have affinity requirements where we need that storage to be close to where the processing is taking place. As we understand the CPU usage for various parts of our system, we also need to pay close attention to any accelerator or other specialized hardware usage. These specialized hardware have significantly different lead and procurement times, whether you're running on-premises or in the cloud, in part because they're scarcer, they're newer, and they often themselves have different affinity requirements such that as you need this many resources, you might actually have to get this many so that you can ensure that clump is close together. To address the problem of that resource planning is uh, resource provisioning is complicated, we want to control for both inorganic growth as well as understand the organic growth of our system. Collecting data about the resource usage is key to building a capacity plan. You should also make sure that you have flexibility in order to allow for your system to become viral or suddenly popular in a way that you didn't understand. Machine learning resources are sometimes a challenge to obtain, and I'm saying this as someone who works at Google and we have a lot of ML resources. It's also important to take locality into consideration as you're building a capacity plan, because not all resources are fungible. And last, rule number five, put users first. As a father, I always wonder if I should give the tablet or not. I'm not going to argue about that. I want the user to be happy. One way of measuring happiness is through a couple of graphs, QPS and latency on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we have time. As you might understand, Google is always concerned about your search results being into your screen fast. That's user happiness. Otherwise, you would go to another search engine. So think about that for any service that we have. This complicated graph is a trace of a TensorFlow tool. It basically does a breakdown from the user to the back end and goes back and, back and forth. It's completely hidden because of confidential purposes, but I wanted, what I want to express here is that we have a mechanism where we can break down when we're delivering content, when we're delivering a service, how the user is experiencing each of those. Because maybe the overall latency is very important, but I also want into account how much time I'm using in resources or how much time I'm in the front end versus the back end. Last, I want a mechanism that grabs, grabs user feedback. You've all used these applications. It doesn't matter if it's Google or another company, Facebook. All these people are doing the right thing. They are asking the user, how do you feel about this mechanism? Then most of the times it's produced by machine learning. It could be also a mechanism used for a service that doesn't have machine learning. But you want to capture that directly feedback from the user. And sometimes you have ways of capturing that are not directly with other metrics. So how do we understand the user's perspective? That's a big problem. We need to measure the success of the user-facing service. We can do that with direct or indirect metrics. We can do that with monitoring uh, the user endpoints. Like we can have the latency in JavaScript code that is basically sent back to the, ser uh, to the server. Or we can do that through instrumentation of the code end to end. And finally, we can sleep. We're happy. In addition to these five rules to survive, let's talk briefly about privacy, which is an essential and first-class component in any machine learning system. Because machine learning 
relies, almost all of these systems rely on user data. That's our information. Well, building the uh, models, your pipeline should anonymize the user data. Personally identifying information, or PII, should not enter into the model so that your system should not allow the identification of any user from one of the prediction outcomes. That is, as an attacker, I couldn't uh, make requests to a system and say, aha, because of this result, I know that Carlos is part of the data set. Your pipeline must be able to confirm the deletion of any personally identifying information. In some places, this is required by law, such as by the GDPR. And you must ensure that it happens and that it happens automatically. You should be certain that your uh, models do not have the user data in them. If, by some chance, data enters into the model that is personally identifying, del delete it, ensure that it's deleted, retrain your model without that data, and push that new model to production. If you have uh, services or products that rely on very deeply personal information, such as uh, a mail service that auto-completes, you can build and deploy models on the device so that no of the, none of the personal identifying information is going to the service provider. And this is possible through the increased availability of on-device chips that are meant for this use. And since we're in Barcelona, uh, let me talk about the future. I put Sagrada Familia because every single time that I come here, even I was raised here, I'm shocked. Like, it goes super fast. Uh, it's amazing that somebody in the past was able to design something that it's still so amazing. However, when we talk about machine learning, not everybody needs to understand it. It's hard. I'm going to confess, sometimes I don't understand it. Nobody can hire a data scientist. Okay? Sometimes you're in a startup or a small company, and you cannot hire a data scientist, and you have an executive telling, we need to have machine learning because the competition has machine learning. Not everybody has the time to prototype new technology because production is on fire. We have technical debt. We need to do code refactoring. Okay? But we're lucky. We're in the age of cloud. We have Google Cloud and many other providers. So I believe that the future is basically AutoML. AutoML provides you fine-tuned models ready for production very, very fast. You know, a model usually goes through ingestion of data, preprocessing, preprocessing or data quality phase, then data scientists building your model, then tuning hyperparameters, which takes a while, then you evaluate, do I like this model? And then you start this phase of deploy, update, deploy, update, deploy, update, to finally be able to predict. And all over these phases, you have login. You have information of you know, how everything is working. But I want something simpler. I want something that basically, I give you a little bit of data. You tune a model that you already have through one snapshot. That a small amount of data that I'm going to give you is personal, personalized for my users. And I go directly from ingestion to prediction. And the fast thing about this, I don't have to be concerned about the development. I don't have to be concerned about the deployment. It's extremely easy. And again, it's black box monitoring. You don't have to take care about the insights. You get the metrics of how the, everything is working. And something that is very important, we are very used to work with third parties APIs. So you just consider this as a third party API. You don't have to think about machine learning. Boom. Super happy. So in conclusion, we've shared with you some uh, ways to build a reliable pipeline and some of the best practices. We've confided in you our five rules to survive, and these are the metrics, the pieces of instrumentation that you, once you add these to your system, you can relax, because we're certain that they will provide a easier to operate and more reliable ML pipeline. Uh, and we also, mentioned privacy, which is key to any machine learning based system because of the amount of user data of trust that users place in these services. Thank you very much. It, uh, we're very excited to be here and we appreciate your listening to us. We have some time for questions. If you think of something later also, you're welcome to send us an email message or ask us on Twitter. Our handles are on this slide. Thank you.